We made it from California. We left California at 1 a.m. and made it. I mean, we made incredible time. We made it through California, Oregon, and most of Washington in one day. Wow. Do you guys totally trade smashing, off? Yeah. You're totally smashing this like internal opinion I have of you of a very sweet smelling man now. Well, you know, oh, all things said, all things said, I actually think I came out smelling like roses, really. <laughs> no real smell. The hair got a little out of control, but. Uh, Whoa. Yeah. So that's why we didn't see much of you. If when if I do manage to get all these out in rover logs, as the rover log goes, my hair goes from like combed to progressively just a disaster because literally at one point, I'm not joking you, on our way home we got stuck in a tornado in an RV. And it was one of the scariest things that's ever happened to me. And so it just wow. goes off the rails. It goes off the rails. It's ridiculous. It was Wait, a hell of a drive home. Where on the West Coast did you encounter yeah, a tornado? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do tell more. Northern California. Northern California. And it was no freaking joke. It was, I, I literally thought I was going to destroy my brand new home. I, <laughs> oh, man. Hail the size of marbles uh, at, at, at unbelievable speeds. It was. How did uh, Rover 2 make it out? Well, pretty good, I think. I mean, Looking I, good? I went and I documented all of it, so I'll put it all out in the, in the Rover log. Oh, but, uh, it, uh, you know, it's funny because we're driving down the road and we're listening to uh, a podcast and the stereo system switches over and there's this piercing emergency sound that comes through the stereo. It resets the volume. It resets it to the wow. FM radio and they override your stereo system and you start getting the, if you are on the road, take cover immediately. This is an emergency. And I'm like, holy crap. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, and Hadia's sitting there driving. She was yep. driving at that, at that point because we were trading off. And uh, she's like, should I keep going? I kind of want to see it. I'm like, uh, and then at first I'm like, yeah, let's keep going. Let's see it. And then, <laughs> and then as, and Think then, of the network, Chris. And then as we start to see the big semi trucks bailing off the road and like taking refuge <laughs> under overpasses, I start to realize this. And then I start to I look ahead. And I'm like, I, I can't see beyond a certain distance. That's all just gray. And and then I'm like, pull over, pull over. <laughs> we got to get off the road. Uh, it was something I did not expect to run into a tornado. And. And, and they're like, if you are in a high-profile vehicle or a motorhome, you may want to consider abandoning the vehicle. Like, this is what they tell you on the radio broadcast. Wow. Because you're extra susceptible to the wind. Right. But the problem is the hail was so powerful and so fast and so strong that you would have been seriously injured if you actually tried to evacuate the vehicle. So we couldn't evacuate the vehicle. You had no choice. We had to stay well, that was easy, in this huge wind catcher, this long, tall <laughs> wall that catches wind. That's why we had to stay in during the tornado because we would have been – I mean, we would have been – seriously injured it was really something can i can i give hmm. you some advice if you ever encounter a tornado again yeah if you're watching it and it doesn't appear moving get out of the way it's coming towards you mm. yeah mm. it was moving five five miles per hour across i-5 and uh one of the things we thought about, because where we had to park, the whole vehicle was unlevel, right? And so you're going through, you're trying to just do everything you can, but the vehicle's really, really off kilter because we're, ha we're half off the road. And like that makes us even more susceptible to wind to getting knocked over, right? Because we're sitting there leaning. And so we're trying to decide, should we put the jacks down? But of course, the jacks are metal, and right. there's tons of lightning because it's a tornado. And so I was like, we can't put the jacks down because then that would ground us because right now we're sitting on rubber, but the vehicle's at a slant. But So if we put the jacks down, it would correct the slant of the vehicle. And make us more stable, but then uh, we were grounding the vehicle, and if we got struck by lightning, we'd be really screwed, so we stayed on the rubber. It was it was really something. It was intense. That sounds like quite the moment. Yeah. I'm glad. I'm very <sighs> thankful that we have you back here. And I got a lot us. of it on camera. Not all of it, but a lot. So I was talking about the uh, tornado just a second ago, but the other thing that worked out really, really well is I, I pulled off at this place called Battle Rock Beach. And it, it was in the middle of the night, so I had no idea what it was like. I kind of, I could tell because I couldn't see, I couldn't see off into the distance. I mm -hmm. thought this might be a great view, so I parked the rig uh, down. This is in Oregon on our way down to Scale. I parked it. Woke up in the morning to this un. That's beautiful. Uh, look at this. I went up. I had to go up and crawl up. Look at that. That's on from the roof of the rover there. Wow. You just parked right there. Yeah. And uh, I, uh, I went out and uh, I got some footage with the GoPro. I got like some super awesome. That's that's I'm I'm holding the GoPro there. Uh, so that, I have it on the stable. Oh, look at how happy you are. So I took it up. I took it up to the water. Now Hadia got this shot from far away. See, I, I'm sitting there trying to get a shot of the ocean. And the water. Ew, there it goes. <laughs> <laughs> 
So I got my boots a little wet for uh, for good footage. Well, it's worth it. Yeah, yeah. That's all all in on the line of duty. But that was turned out to be a great spot on the way down. You, I mean, you you know, I don't even know if you can get a hotel that nice. Yeah, right. right? That's that was waterfront. Pretty pretty. And you just great. wandered right down to the water. Made up for the tornado on the way back from scale. Mm-hmm. Oh, so this is on the way down. Yeah, this is on the way down. And really, the 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 whole payoff was getting to see Popey, who turns out to be a well-smelling gentleman. Oh. Yeah, I can confirm <laughs> he does smell well in real life. He and, caught me on a good day. <laughs> well, uh, no, I mean, no, no. A conference uh, when you're traveling, not your typical good day. I Because I'll tell you what happened to me. Total devastating disaster. We were moving from the old rover to the new rover, Lady Jupiter, as we call her. Uh. And we moved everything except for the absolutely most important things for a, for a trip like this. My mixer, my microphone. Oh, Chris. And... And all of the toiletries, all of it, toothbrushes, combs, uh, hair, anything, so oh. anything, left it all. So we got down in the, on the road and realized we didn't have any of our stuff. It was awful. So, Popey, I, I congratulate you for making it over to the west coast of the U.S. of A. and smelling like a gentleman. With your while basic at, hygiene intact. While at a conference. That's a, that is I, a true feat. I'll tell you what, the, the hotel we stayed in was okay. Um, and, and as with all many canonical events, when there's more than a certain number of people, we share rooms. So I shared a room with one of the other community guys, Michael Hall. And, uh, you know, we didn't, uh, the shower wasn't huge. Uh, so squeezing us both in there together was a little bit of a squash, <laughs> but you know, we managed. <laughs> of course. That sounds fun. <laughs> asking for fan art. <laughs> <laughs> This is Linux Unplugged, episode 129 for January 26, 2016. Welcome to Linux Unplugged, your weekly Linux talk show that's recovered from the scale hangover by drinking beer. My name is Chris. My name is Wes. Hey there, Wes. And a good beer it is this week. It sure is. It's a sour one. Now, coming up on this week's episode of The Unplugged Show, we don't have a sour show. No, no. Never. We have a great show. We're going to have some updates from our friends on some of the projects they've been working on in the Linux community. Then did you hear the big drama around the Linux Foundation kicking out the individual contributor? (laughs) It's a big hoopla. We'll tell you what's going on, who's spreading rumors, and what the reality likely is with the Linux Foundation. Then, later on, have you wondered... Where the hell is Wayland? Wait, Why? what? Well, it's almost become a joke. Wayland hasn't shipped yet. Why? I actually went back in the Linux Action Show archives. I went back as far as 2011. We were still Yikes. making jokes that Wayland wouldn't ship this year. And that means we probably predicted in 2009 it would ship. I mean, that's it's a mess. I'll explain why Wayland hasn't shipped, and it's not the reason you're thinking. In fact, if you're asking that question, you're asking the wrong question. Hmm. Hmm. That's right. That's right. That's right. And then, towards the end of the show this week. Wes is best friends over at AMD. Good buds at AMD. I love those guys. They have launched today GPU Open. GPU Open. Actually, I don't know if it was launched today. But they have launched recently GPU Open. And <laughs> we will talk about that. Uh, as well as catch up on shenanigans. Maybe chat a little about scale. And all of those goodies right here on the Unplugged Show. You know, before we get rolling, let's bring in that mumble room, our virtual lug. Time appropriate greetings, mumble room. Hey, I'm a greetings. Hello, guys. Hello. So I don't know if anybody out there in the mumble land is uh, drinking along with the show today, uh, but uh, Wes brought in uh, a real sour beer. This mm-hmm. is a sour beer. It's called Wild Sour, uh, and it's uh, the Flanders Red, product of the USA. It's got a BA score of 82, has an APV, an ABV of 6%. Uh, this is a really, like, it almost tastes like, like the sour stuff that's in some sour foods. It's mm-hmm. so sour. But it's also got a really nice, clean finish. I like it a lot. So we're, that's what we're drinking this week on the Unplugged. We've been doing the beer thing to sort of encourage the community yes. hangout aspect. It's been fun. So, Wes, we have a big story to talk about that I, I meant to cover in Linux Action Show last week. Uh, but the scale shenanigans totally got away with the, uh, things and uh, didn't, get a, didn't get a chance to cover this. And so I wanted to give a mention out to Jonathan Thomas, who shipped OpenShot 2.0 beta. This has been uh, the Kickstarter project we've all been waiting for. Uh, OpenShot 2.0 is a whole bunch of new stuff, a whole bunch of uh, – it's the new UI look. It's, it's a whole bunch of fixes he's been working on, and Kickstarter backers are getting the update first. Uh, it's pretty exciting because you guys know I, I follow uh, – 
Linux editing pretty closely, and I still think it's a pretty bad state of affairs. <laughs> he put together a little video. Let's check it out. It's pretty cool. Look at that. That's him putting that out. Now, I'll jump ahead a little bit here. So you can get a basic idea of what the UI looks like here. It's, it's nice, and it's available. It works on Windows. It's going to work on the Mac and Linux, of course. He's showing it here under Ubuntu. I, uh, I am hopeful. I am hopeful. I am. I am not exactly. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what to expect yet. Still, there's mm -hmm. no binaries that I have found. Even though I'm a, I'm a Kickstarter backer, I, 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 maybe I missed an email. I, that's very possible because I've been traveling. Uh, uh, but the source code is on GitHub right now. Nice. In fact, I think like even 205 beta is up or something like that is up on GitHub. So you could go get it right now. It just doesn't include a lot of a lot of things you need to make it all run. But there is uh, hope out there. We have a couple of good video editors that are in the works right now. Mm -hmm. So I don't think OpenShot's ready yet. But hey, you know what? It's great to finally see some code shipping after quite a while. After I, I can't even remember, but I think it's I think it's been a few years now. So yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Poby, uh, welcome back from uh, from the U.S. of A. How was your visit? Did we treat you okay while you were over here? Oh, yeah, I had an amazing time. Loved it. Absolutely I, loved that's it. That's great. I asked Pope, I said, so what was one of the first things you did when you got here? And he's like, well, I got chicken wings. <laughs> of course. <laughs> nice. Yeah, did you, did you get beer with the chicken wings or just the chicken of wings? Of course, yeah. <laughs> found, a, found a nice little uh, place called Barney's and uh, had uh, some Belgian beer and uh, chicken wings. And that sorted me out real, really good. After now, is this, the, is this your, is this isn't your first visit to California, is it? No, it's the first one to LA. I've been to... Palo Alto and oh, okay. um, Oakland and San Francisco. So what did you think? What strikes you when you visit here? I'm curious, just from somebody who doesn't really have that outsider's perspective. When you get here, what? even if it's been like, even if you've had the revelation before, what is it that strikes you when you visit? Uh, so customer service is the first thing. Like, it, it, it's night and day compared to the UK. So over there um, in the US, it feels like people genuinely want to serve you well and mm -hmm. for you to have a good time whereas over here you'll get a surly person who doesn't give a shit whether you have a good time or not <laughs> and whether you enjoy your food or drink or whatever whereas over there when we're in the bar all the waitresses are very friendly and uh, the waiters as well it was just I just had a really really nice time and I feel mm. like the people are nice and genuine and Pasadena is a lovely lovely place yeah it I really is I it. was really surprised by how great of a venue that was <clears throat> yeah, and how convenient huge. it was to like really great food uh, Ubicon had an after party at the Brazilian barbecue, Ooh. which is which happened to be where we went for lunch that day. It's just an incredible venue, really nice, classy, accessible, but big enough to host a large group. And that was one of many places around the convention center. Yeah, so. you could have gone to a different place every night, and you mm -hmm. know, we and we randomly chose most of them. We didn't have to, you know, go looking for Yelp reviews or anything. We stumbled on this little Korean place, which was a little bit weird. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was it was super cheap, and the few food was uh, part Korean, part Japanese. So it was like sushi and Korean sake and stuff. But all the while, there was a TV which was constantly streaming Korean uh, pop music, which was really weird. You know, they're so really it's weird, funny you say like, that. There are videos. a lot of Korean channels in Pasadena because the the uh, the Lady Jupiter has uh, a HD antenna that goes up. Oh, one of the first things I do now that I got this is I raise the. It's like That's it's awesome. It's, it's literally called the Batwing antenna, and you you sit there and you crank it up and it goes up and it kind of looks like a Batwing. And I tuned in about thirty uh, uh, non English channels, and about half of them were Korean. It's funny. I just that couldn't MD stop. Live I couldn't take. That. I couldn't take my eyes off the TV while I, yeah. while I was eating my dinner. Was like, every time I went back to the rover, I'm like, turn that on. I'm like, holy crap, look at this. This is unbelievable. Uh, yeah, but Micah. Yeah, we had, had a great time. Micah was there. Uh, he he helped us out with the reservations at the meetup. Uh, Popey was able to come and say hi to the meetup. He made an appearance because, you know, he was a working girl while while at uh, the convention. That's well, right. we all were in a sense, but, I mean, he had to go back and, and uh, do his business. So how did that all go for you? Was it a decent success? Would you do it again? Yeah, totally. Uh, I, I like the... Uh, so the Ubicon was good because there were a few uh, talks that I I didn't know about, you know, stuff that I mm. was I was interested in hmm. in seeing. So actually, you know, as someone who's one of the well, partially one of the organisers, and I was giving a talk myself, um, it was really nice for me to hear like what other people in the community had to say and see a different perspective than you know just the one from Canonical. Tell me a little bit about your talk. So I talked about a service that. Uh, 
I created. So immediately before my talk, Stuart Langridge talked about building services right. on top of Ubuntu phone. So rather than just, you know, nagging us about yep. when the next phone is going to be available, when, you know, moaning that there's no game center or something like that, rather than you know, moan about it, why don't you build go it. out there and build something? Right. So his talk was all about building something. And that kind of dovetailed nicely with my mine and his joint talk, which was we built something. So, um, yeah, it was quite cool. It was nice. And I did a demo and it worked. And I That's even, always nice. Yeah. I had a webcam pointed at a phone in my house a few thousand miles away just to prove that it wow. was doing what it wanted to do. So, Very yeah, that was nice. quite good fun. Yeah. Cool. Had have had the foresight to set up a webcam before I left the house flying around <laughs> the world. Well, I had, a, I had like five minutes to talk to uh, Mark Shuttleworth and uh, – I asked him if uh, this is going to be something that they're probably going to keep doing. And he kind of gave me a canned answer, which I kind of <laughs> gave him a hard time about. But essentially, he said that uh, that the the unconference format feels pretty good to him, uh, and that that this in person thing and go and 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 sort of riding along with another conference seems like a no brainer for them. So I don't know, Poby, if you guys are going to do something like Ubicon again, but I thought yeah, we are. I thought it was a big draw. I, I saw I talked to a lot of people that were there specifically to go to Ubicon. So. I think it's something you guys should keep up with. Yeah, the next one's going to be in Europe. Uh, I think Germany is the next one uh, towards the end of the year. I yes. think it might even be booked in for November. So oh, okay. Nice. We'll, prob- uh, we'll probably alternate, you know, and have one in Europe, one in the US. And then, but the thing is, it's not us as in Canonical that organize them. It's up to the community. If you, if you want to have one, you create one in your region and uh, so, you know, we'll help you where we can. How did that work exactly? So the Ubicon that happened at scale was set oh, up was by so a virtual. Of... Who is that? This, who's uh, who's talking back to us? All right, Wes has got Wes is watching. Uh, there it was the it was the virtual uh, user or the virtual it was the real actual users group the physical users group that right. that sort of organized it. How did that work exactly? So the Southern California uh, Linux user groups and the and the low code teams the Ubuntu community teams are all really active. And there, many of them are involved in um, scale anyway. So it was very easy for them to, you know, organize things with scale and get the venue and get the rooms booked and all that kind of stuff. So they did all the logistics and, you know, we have a stand in the expo area and all that at scale as well. And for the whole of like for Ubicon as well. So mm-hmm. um, it was very easy for them to do that organization because they were already linked to an existing event. And I think that's where it probably pays off is if, if you're in a local area and there's already an event nearby, you can tack one day or two yeah. days on. Seems like a good relationship, and, you know. Create, yeah. yeah, and it, it, it you know it means you don't you as a yeah. as a community person don't have to fork out for a you know huge venue that's very expensive. And that Pasadena Center is massively expensive. It's really really expensive. Yeah, well, it's a nice venue, so I would imagine it is. Yeah, uh, we had a chance to chat with uh, one of the organizers about the incredible ham radio setup they have there just so that way the different uh, organizers can communicate. Oh, really? Wow. That's how they punch through some of the interferences. They use ham radio. And it was so cool to hear them geek out about that. And you, and then he pointed out where some of the antennas were. If you look, you can see like they have, and and the Pasadena Convention Center, of course, is pre-wired. They have antennas right. installed because this is a this is a common thing, I guess. Pretty neat. Pretty cool. I mean, it's a pretty big event. I mean, you have to keep this in perspective. It's being put on by the community, right? right? It's not, it's not O'Reilly Media coming in and and organizing all of this. It's not the Linux Foundation that is organizing all of this. It's the community, it's the community. and it's still a huge event. Uh, I think I, they said they had something like three thousand six hundred yeah. people. That's that awesome. was that was the number I heard too. Was thirty six hundred? That's just what I was going to add. So, um, it was a really cool event. I mean, we're going to go more in detail in Linux Action Show, but uh, it was really neat to see there, Popey. And uh, I would encourage yeah, people to, see to check you and it out too. And you know what? We had a hell of a meetup. A hell of a meetup. It was it was pretty funny because uh we had forty people RSVP or plus forty plus people RSVP. Mm-hmm. And so uh Micah sixty eight there in the chat room, or was it no not Micah it was Micah, not Micah sixty eight, different Micah, uh <laughs> in the chat room, uh realized well we should probably give these people a heads up. Well, at the time he gave them a heads up, it was only 20 on the meetup list oh. or something like that. And then they lost the reservation altogether. They lost it altogether. And so I get there and I'm like, it was a reservation for 20, but it's probably going to be more than that. 
And then I'm like, I should, and then like five minutes go by, and I'm like, I should probably let her know by more than that. I mean double. Yep. So I'm like, all right, <laughs> let so, me clarify. But they never, they never heard me after the number twenty. They just went with the number. So and like party of twenty. Yeah, we have twenty people coming. Yeah, they got twenty. We need to set up a table for twenty. Like I heard them talking all the time about twenty people. I'm like, and I kept like, uh, ma'am, it's it's probably gonna be more than like forty. Uh, Eventually, we just completely overtook their entire outer seating area. I mean, I think it was like maybe 55, 60 people. I don't know how many people it was. Wow, that's great. It was huge. It was huge. Uh, it's a nice so, place as well. We went there a few times, and uh, yes. the beer the beer is good in there, and the food was good, too. Yeah, the Yard House. Yeah. They oh, had nice. a great selection of beer. Great selection, which yeah. was the rarity, including uh, Ian from System 76 had me try this peanut butter beer that he got. Peanut butter beer. Peanut butter beer. Whoa. And it was smooth. It was real smooth. I got a uh, local. You don't want chunky peanut butter beer. I got some. I got some. Yeah, you don't. I got some uh, strong um, uh, Belgium ale. Uh, mm. I can't remember the name of it was now, but it was really good. It was, it was excellent. Uh, hey, you know something we've been talking about here on this show? I don't know. I'm just. I'm fascinated. Ike or Josh aren't here to, uh, today to talk about it with us, but uh, a lot going on with Solus. I don't know. Maybe it's the way they communicate. Uh, maybe it's the the, the brash. Um, goals that they have, something about this project. I, I'm just fascinated. Very visible. Right? Yeah. And so uh, they're going out and uh, making waves again, and uh, the, f- the folks over at Softpedia have been really... I, 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 I want to I couch this conversation. Just about, they've been really making some changes over at Softpedia, and I want to talk about that with you guys, too. Wimpy, you're in here, right? I want to talk to you about this, too. Uh, but SolOS is going to be supported for the next couple of years, this next version. And so I guess they say they're going to try to squash, I quote, all bugs. <laughs> and uh, I don't know how the hell that's possible, but alongside uh, with their crunch and focus for 1.1, we're also continuing our campaign of bug crushing. We have crushed 22 bugs over the last week, ranging from long string bugs that have been resolved since Budgie rewrite to recent ones that related to inclusions of Git-based patches for new software in the repo. So they're going through making a, supposedly this next release super, super solid, Wes. What would it take? This is, this is my question to you. What would it take for you to honestly and legitimately install Solus and run it on like this laptop or a work machine that you are going to use every single day? What would it take? I think it really probably comes down to package availability. I'm doing a, I'm going to do a little bit of, bit of work to get the packages if I need to. Nothing crazy. Uh, but if I can use the tools I expect day to day, in a you know, even if it's like a compiling or something akin to yeah. So it sounds like the barrier is not high. Yeah. No. I mean, it, everything looks nice. I'd have to play around with Budgie a little more to see if it met you know like hmm. my workflow. But I assume I could change that if I. Need. Is anybody in the mumble room using this as their daily driver right now? Yeah, that's a good question. It doesn't sound like it. I don't think it's reached that level yet. All right. Maybe well, when this one point one comes out, I'll step up and put it on this laptop. I don't want to. I don't. I don't really know. I don't know how to. Sh- I don't want to do this without. There's a lot of softpedia shame online. A lot of people don't like softpedia. Yep. And uh, as somebody who just takes in a lot of news sources, I just sort of weigh each article on its own merits, and I sort of build sort of a you know a following with an author, those kinds of things. And right. so for me, it's not so much about where you publish; it's more about what you publish. But regardless, softpedia has a hell of a name, and not necessarily a good one at that. And I've been watching their coverage recently, and. I don't actually know of another outlet out there, say, maybe Pharonix, that is actually as closely following less headline-grabbing projects that do deserve attention. Yep. And uh, and they're also following projects that do deserve attention. But I find, I find that they're actually, in some cases, contacting the distro makers and getting quotes and actually verifying things, which... Why, is, that sounds like real reporting. Yeah, and I'm wondering, Wimpy, I know I've seen a lot of articles from them about Matei Edition... I'm wondering what your experience has been at, on the end of the person getting reported on and, and, and what your experience, because that's, that's a pretty valuable perspective. Um, yes, uh, Softpedia certainly strike me as an outlet that are far more grassroots community focused. So they are paying attention to a broader range of Linux news that appeals to probably more the enthusiast you don't see so much of sort of right. you know, the enterprise stuff it's sort of you know more that's a good way more to put desktop it. and yeah. mobile um and yes in the past they have um contacted me directly to clarify things prior to putting stuff out um but in the main they like to be first to report mm. on things mm. so um you know 
there is. Yeah. It, it, depends. I think it depends whether it's a big story and they want to be first or if yeah. it's something new and they want to be, you know, uh, accurate. It varies. But also, I forget his um, surname, uh, Swapnil from... Used to be Muck, Mucktware and Linux Vader. Uh, he writes for various places. He's very good as well. If he wants to cover a story, he's very thorough. He sets up a... Um, a Google Doc and gets all of the involved parties together and has a whole question and wow. answer and has various people come in and actually sort of write their responses and then he brings that all together. So he's the most journalistic of the people that I've encountered that really goes to people and gets gets not just copy off the website but actually wow. you know what was his name again Wimpy? what was his name again? Swap uh, at, oh, oh yeah, yeah swap. Oh, I, sorry I missed that yeah, yeah. of course I know he uh, was at uh, scale actually oh, he yeah. interviewed yeah. Uh, a whole bunch of us from Ubuntu there was like eight of I us sat around picture. a table yeah and, I, I uh, love the picture he got of you guys crossing the street uh, he posted that to Google Plus oh that god is... I hate that photo what the one, the one that you I like you look great in that photo you look like you're contemplating and looking ahead to the future thinking about converged devices it's a great shot of you I think I was just trying not to get run over. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, okay, yeah. I, I told him, you know, the problem with Swapney is, uh, is well, and I'm, not, I'm already doing it right now, is I want to say Swap when I say his name. So that's that's really the big problem is I just want to call him Swap. But, uh, yeah, you yeah. Know, you don't need Swap now if you have two gigs of RAM. <laughs> wow. Jeez, rotten. Oh, but I'm bummed. Uh, anyways, so, uh, yeah, I, I agree. That, that is, uh, to see Softpedia take a step up is is nice. Hopefully, here's the, here's the photo I was talking about. Hopefully, uh, look at it. That's Popey there in the in the jacket with the you know, third over from the left. Beautiful. That's a great shot. It man. really is. That is. Look at look at that. That's the, uh, that's Wapney's Ubuntu crew crossing the street sort of uh, in, uh, in echo yeah. of... Uh, the uh, the famous Beatles shot, I think. That's pretty good. That's mm-hmm. a pretty good shot. So there's only one thing I would say about Swapnil is that when he made that um, that muckware version of the onion was really annoying because he had it, it was muckware was both news and fake news. So oh, it was kind of like it's difficult. It's why difficult. it's like why are you purposefully creating noise? There is uh, much discussion to be had there, but that said, I would I would encourage people, you know, uh, to just sort of reconsider from time to time and con- and take each article in its own perspective. Yep. And of course, LinuxActionShow.reddit.com is a great place to discuss the merits of an article because I do read those comments and weigh them when I'm thinking about covering a story. Um, so yeah, I, I I have found them, their coverage to be interesting. I've, it's it's been something I've been starting to visit on a reoccurring basis. Always good to see better, you know, more and better Linux news coverage. Yeah, sure, yeah, sure, very much so. You know what else is new, better, and always getting better? That's our friends over at DigitalOcean. Man, they've been making UI improvements that I love. It's some really nice stuff to make you do things that, that make it possible to do things at scale. Yeah, speaking of scale, oh. Oh, look at that. Use our promo code right now. Won't you do one plug to support this show and get a ten dollar credit over at DigitalOcean, which is a simple cloud hosting provider dedicated to offering the most intuitive and easy way for you to get a Linux rig super fast in the cloud that you control. Root access, HTML5 console when you need to really screw around with that thing, and you can get started in less than fifty five seconds. Fifty five seconds. Whoa, man, that is really something. That is. Whoa, five hundred twelve megabytes of RAM. Boom, twenty gigabyte SSD. Boom, one CPU and a terabyte. A terabyte of absolute domination transfer for five dollars a month. Use that promo code Do Unplugged, one word lowercase. You get ten dollar credit. And the really nice thing about da- DigitalOcean is they got data centers out the wazoo. Yep. They got them all over the place. Wherever you want to look like a boss, you can have a data center. If it's in New York, yeah, you got a data center in New York. If it's in San Fran, yeah, now you got one in San Fran. Oh, Singapore, sure. Amsterdam, you know of how they course. roll there. Yeah. But let me tell you about Toronto. That's where you go Ooh. to be in the north. Right, right there on the Americas. But guess what's not in Toronto? The NSA. Oh, also, by the way, Germany. This is a sweet spot for all of Germany's neighbors. Or if you want to stream something to Merkel herself, you gotta have a date. You gotta have a droplet in, in Germany. country. It's the only way she's gonna watch it. But really, what's great about DigitalOcean is their awesome support of Linux, working upstream, all SSD drives, and this incredible interface. Mm, I love this interface. Which the only thing better about this interface, the only thing better is the API. Oh, man, that API. Holy cow, the API is straightforward, but the nice thing about it, and I'm going to tell you, Wes, sometimes I hit the lazy button. See what I do here is I go over to this community page, and you just go to community, and then you go to projects, 
And you're like, I want to have a project, right? No, no. This is where you go to find a whole bunch of really good open source code Woo-hoo. that's already written around that DigitalOcean API. And there is tons of stuff you can take advantage of right now. I'd be scrolling if you're watching the video. Oh, did you version. see that? I was just using the Vagrant inter- integration the other day. Really? Yeah. How so, Why Wes? spin up a VM on my local machine when I can get one in the cloud? Totally. They're so cheap, right? Totally, totally. In fact, they even have hourly pricing. And on top of all of that, with one-click applications, deployments that are super easy, they also have great guides. Like, here's one they just posted on how to set up Let's Encrypt certificates nice. for multiple Apache virtual hosts on Ubuntu 14.04. That's seriously helpful. DigitalOcean.com, use the promo code DO Unplugged. Go get your own super fast rig up in the cloud that you have root access to. You can do whatever you want, either, either deploy applications with a single click or set up the entire infrastructure yourself. Be a boost at DigitalOcean.com. Use the promo code DO Unplugged. And a big thank you to DigitalOcean, not only for rocking so hard and making Linux super cool and for a first class citizen on your service and using the Linux to power the entire infrastructure. KVM. Yep. But also for supporting the show with Dio Unplugged. DigitalOcean.com. Thanks, guys. All right. We, it is almost, it's almost a joke now. Where in the world is Wayland? And it's always like, is it ever going to ship? And I, I will admit of having fully participated in the joke, I was going to play a clip for you guys uh, where, where we predicted Wayland would ship to show you, just as a bit of context, how long we have been expecting Wayland to be the default display server. And this is sort of where you go off the rails, but bear with me for a second. Um, best I could estimate, I think in 2009, but I, or 2010, actually. I think it was 2010. A long time ago. 2010, I said it would be default. In 2011, 2012, and 2013, I made a joke prediction, as well as did Brian and Matt at those times, that Wayland would still not be shipping and no one would care. And it has sort of been the joke prediction in our show for so many years that we stopped making the joke. It's still a joke. I, I heard the joke at scale. And the problem is, it's actually completely and totally the wrong question. The question really isn't, is Wayland ready yet? That's not really what you should be asking. The better question is, is GNOME ready yet? Or is Kwin ready yet? Because, I mean, yes, it's been, it's, there has been work that needs to happen on Wayland, but Wayland itself is a protocol. I'm going to get more into that in a second. But <clears throat> blog post here uh, from uh, the uh, GNOME blog, uh, and I'm, I'm forgetting the uh, person's name right now because, uh, you know, uh, pro- I'm going to blame it on the beer. Uh, he says, it's been our goal now for a while to get to a point where Wayland uh, could be declared complete and ready to be enabled by default. We've come a long way since starting the porting effort in 2013. In fact, we feel we're close enough that we can aim for Wayland by default in Fedora 24. Uh, so this is, you know, something that's been everybody's been talking about for quite a while now. For, you know, getting Wayland by default. There's been a lot of work fixing things like dialog boxes and pop-ups and applications. GTK Plus has had a lot of work that's gone into it. Kinetic scrolling now works better under Wayland. Drag and drop now works under Wayland. Copy and paste is getting close in a lot of cases. <laughs> but this isn't the problem. See, what we, what, what, this is what you have to understand. The question isn't really, is Wayland ready yet? That doesn't make a lot of sense. Wayland is a communication protocol and says very little about the implementation of the two sides you want to communicate, say your web browser, a compositor. The protocol is stable and has been for a while, but not every compositor and or toolkit or application speak Wayland yet, so it may not be sufficient for your use case. So rather than asking, is Wayland ready yet, you should be asking, can I run GNOME or KDE or Enlightenment under Wayland? Are they talking Wayland yet? Because they have to be their own compositor now. They have to do that own work. They have to be their own server, talking Wayland to the client application. Like, all this stuff now has to be implemented. The burden's on them. It's just not done yet. It's not ready yet. Um, but we still talk about it like if Wayland isn't shipping. Wayland shipped! Everybody, news alert right here. You can here. use it today. Breaking news on the Unplugged program. This is CNN Breaking News. Wayland shipped. It shipped a while ago. One, it's it's done. The problem is graphic drivers aren't ready. The desktop environments aren't ready. All of our little esoteric applications aren't ready yet. We're not ready. Wayland is here. It's good. Um, yeah. I mean, so I, I, I wanted to just sort of talk about this for a second because it's sort of, I heard it come up at scale. I've seen it online a million times. I, there's a blog post about it right now. Why aren't we shipping Wayland yet? I've even, I've even participated in it. And in the reality, it's just that it showed up and we weren't ready for it. It's kind of what it feels like. I don't know. I think I think what the author says here at the bottom that there are exceptions. You know that the protocol does still need a few things to be worked out in a way that's not 
in- implementation defined, you know? So we, hmm. we, don't, we want to make sure that KDE and GNOME don't do disparate things where the protocol is maybe yes. lacking clarification That's or true. lacking right. a definition. Right, right. So, and I wonder too, in a world where the Linux desktop is already not, you know, like a primary citizen, how much capability we can sacrifice hmm. to transition and still make it work in so a you mean like, way. So you mean like if we don't get it right, right. like the if copy and paste almost works, well, how many people who use Mac or Windows can deal with not having copy and paste, right? So I don't know. I I think we're getting really close. I think that this is a good, a very good point and that, you know, we are already seeing like GNOME. And I, I love when we see the updates from the GNOME team and the KDE team about how far they're compositing their window managers are coming, especially the KDE updates, but... Yeah. Kitson, you think that's indicative of maybe a, a systemic problem in the desktop projects themselves or the communities? What do you mean? Uh, possibly. It just seems like at least one of the desktops would have it fully working by now since, you know, it's already shipped. It's been shipping for, what, six months, about a year now. Um, I'm just kind of surprised that, like, the X standards where they uh, got together and all agreed on certain standards or for, like, the icons, et cetera, drag and drop, copy paste, all that stuff, there was actually a huge uh, foundation that was created t- just for that. Why don't they do the same thing for Wayland? I thought it was kind of being put on by the same people. I thought it was my understanding. Uh, Heavens, I want to give you a chance to jump in just before we go too much further. Go ahead. Well, <clears throat> there's a really easy or simple reason why people seem to think of Wayland as a thing, because our old X server was a server and a thing which had to run, which Wayland doesn't need to run. It's just a protocol for the window manager or des- yeah, window manager to actually manage and use, as, use its compositor through. So based on the X386 migrating to the XOR server, it, people just confuse it that way. Also... Wayland is secure by default, which is why something as weird as copy and paste or moving things between one composited window to another secure posit- like composited right. window right. is a little bit tricky, while the X server is insecure and root horror by default. Right. The, 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 that's actually, so we were talking about the copy pasting. The problem is, is these are all isolated, protected applications now. And so we've sharing, grown used to not having the security. Yeah. Yeah. So sharing data between them is, is tricky. William, go ahead. I want you to get a chance to jump in. Yeah, so I don't think it's so much the desktops holding it back, because GNOME actually has pretty decent Wayland support if you use, say, the latest Fedora image. So it's, um, like it's mostly uh, graphics drivers at this point, right? Because yeah, it works fine yeah. on Intel for the most part, but well, if you go to still NVIDIA issues, or AMD, but yeah, yeah. you're still missing complete OpenGL ES support, which right. you need for Wayland to run. Yes. So well, and, and that's honestly, back anyway. you, nobody's buying a $1,000 plus computer and saying, I don't need my GPU. Let's, I mean, right. maybe some of the most hardcore open source advocates are, but the majority of consumers are not going to buy a computer with a $300 oh. part in it and be like, I don't need that. Right. You could get Iris Pro graphics that work, though. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there's decent. some people, yeah, some people are totally happy uh, with the Intel graphics. My issue with Intel graphics remains once you put them in a high DPI environment, that you again feel the immediate crippling of integrated oh, sure. graphics. Yeah, right. If you use it in a 1080p environment or even a 2K environment, Iris would probably work for uh, people who don't play games a lot. Yep. But uh, yeah, in high DPI, it's just it's awful. Um, this is really this is really something that I, uh, I I find to be fascinating. Now, Wimpy, what is the Maui project? I know I've heard the name before. Is that like Rebecca of Black Linux? What is this? No, no, it's um, Maui is the operating system, and I think it's the Hawaii desktop or something. Oh, yes, I believe Hawaii. so. Yeah, 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 yeah. But they they took the Western uh, reference compositor and they, and then built up a, a sort of a lightweight right. desktop environment around it, and it's the only. Aside from GNOME 3, which is sort of adapted from X to Wayland, this is the only desktop environment that was focused on Wayland from the outset. Now, um, I don't know if we've actually had a chance to install it, but I think we actually talked about this about a year ago. So has this been around for a while? Because I think we... Yeah, yeah, I've, yeah, I've been aware of it for a few years. <clears throat> because their, I, I don't know if it still is, but it was... was 2014. Okay. Now, I think yeah, that, so. but you brought up an important point when describing it is, so you've guys, you guys out there have heard of Wayland, obviously. The other thing you'll often hear about is Weston. Weston is a reference compositor. Weston is not really something, it's not like, it's, it's not something the KWIN developers are going to use. It's not something the GNOME people are going to use. It's, it was a reference point. That's what Weston is. And that's been done for a while, too. Right. Now, what were you going to mention? Well, I was going to say, here's another um, Wayland focus 
environment uh, that is supposed to be a uh, drop-in replacement for the i3 window manager. Is that, what is this called here? Yeah, Sway Window S- Manager. Sway WM, yeah. Dot org. Uh, boy, look at this. So, okay. I mean, I think as these things come along, power users may be, you know, if there's a nice Thailand window manager, maybe I can make oh. do with Wayland right now. Yeah, and we're watching a little demo. They have a little demo video up under uh, on their website there. Uh, that does look pretty good. So, so this I is... I can do this, and then maybe MP, MPV Ooh, plays with sm- zero. Look at that. It's kind of smooth, too. It, it actually has some... This is kind of nice. Yeah, right? I might give this a try. This could be a legitimate way to get into Wayland a little sooner and not expect all of the features of such a rich desktop environment like GNOME. And you or could KD probably Network. have this as one of your logins, right? You know, from your display yeah. manager and then go back to X if you needed to. You know, he's playing video there in that one in that one window. There's no tearing there. That's no, nice. it looks beautiful. Yeah. Ooh. The dream. Let's put a link to this in the doc. I'll put a in the, so we can have that in the show notes. That's pretty cool if you guys want to check that out. So it's a tiling window. Uh, do you call it a window manager now? Yep. Well, that's what it is. Yeah, they say window manager. So <laughs> okay. It's actually a successor to i3 because yeah. the i3 team said they weren't going to make an, uh, a Sofa Wayland version. So that's why they made and, it. And it, cool. it says that they bring in I, your i3 configuration file. So it has i3 configuration oh, compatibility. Oh, oh. And i3 IPC compatibility, which would probably mean like some of those plugins and stuff, mm-hmm. which is super cool. And also, also, multi-head support. So. Ooh, and gap support, which I know what, you had to compile in separately What's gap sometimes. support? Is that for like, uh, the, like in the monitor? Uh, no, like between your tiles. If you don't want them right next to each other, you can have a little window gap between them. Oh, your, that's which cool. Which can look pretty if you want to see a little bit of your that, background. See, now you guys have wanted me to take a, uh, a tiled window manager uh, challenge for a while. This is the way for it to get me in now. Now I'm like, this is yeah. awesome. This is really cool. So yeah, drop-in replacement for i3 Window Manager, but for Wayland instead. It will work with your existing i3 configuration files and adds a few extra features on top of that. And the other thing, I don't know what the state of multi-monitor support is for like KWIN and, and GNOME. I'm That's sure a good it's, question. Probably depends on the driver. Hmm. Uh, North Ranger, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I think uh, you know we're finally getting to a point of critical mass with Wayland where the whole ecosystem around it. And that's really what we've been waiting for for a long time, as everybody's alluded to. It's drivers, it's desktop environments, it's the apps. And we've been through this kind of thing before. I mean, there was a long time ago when Linux kernel was at 2.2, and you know, people didn't trust you know, kernel 2.4 for a long time. You know, so early adopters were hitting it first, you know, things like that. Same thing with file systems. Um, and you know, so I think there's a lot of similarities there. And you know, overall, I'm hopeful. And I think we are reaching that tipping point where people want the security that comes with Wayland. You know, the performance is pretty much a wash. Um, and you know, we're, we're finally getting that decent support from the drivers and the ecosystem side. Yeah, I, I really hope that does pan out. Uh, I'm still waiting but for mine, but yeah. I, I definitely am ready to not see when I full screen video to see tearing. Right. So I was done with Have that. Have video first class under Linux. Yeah, I would love that. Uh, and, and, you know, just the just it, just the, the sense of knowing that I'm using something that's not so archaic, like, <laughs> there's no material impact other than I guess my, my security is probably not as good as it should be. Right. But I would, I'm ready to move on. In, in. All right. Anybody else in the mumble room have any uh, closing thoughts on, on the Wayland stuff before we uh, move on? Do, do you really think Wayland's about to be heralded in? I still feel like it's a long way away. <sighs> hmm. I mean, for example, in the last few years whilst Wayland's been brewing we've all been spoiled with steam yeah and while we don't have proprietary driver support for Wayland I can't see people who have embraced steam on their Linux workstations wanting to switch anytime soon no I you know I true that with the x the x um Shim, the X Wayland thing, isn't that what that's for anyway? But see, this is the thing, though. At games, yeah. you're going to want the best performance right. possible. Uh, I, I, I know that uh, the next that series... Brings up, oh, that brings up that whole debate about, you know, how should Linux do games? Should we have a way in the protocols right. to give games there is that. full video well, game? When it comes to Wayland and KDE and GNOME, it's up to KDE and GNOME to actually get this implemented and deployed. It's not Wayland themselves which can actually deploy something and get everyone on it. It's built in to the desktop I guess the question there would be, be is be there fair. protocol implementations they could make to make gaming better? Right. <laughs> well, that's well, what it's not about do. making gaming better. And I don't think that GNOME and KDE can be faulted because they've both been working very hard on bringing that's Wayland why. support like, to their they've been too desktop busy. environments. They've been too busy, um, what is it, making their desktops actually usable and getting all the ironing mm-hmm. all the bugs out from their new three dot what 10 releases kd5 releases once they get all these 
bugs and things wrinkles smoothed out from their new desktop environment implementations, they can finally focus on something that is on a back burner, which is Wayland support. I would say... Well, no, 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 I disagree. <coughs> I disagree. Because what's actually been happening is that the toolkits have been evolving. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the de desktop environments that are built on top of those toolkits have been evolving alongside those. And that work has been moving on at quite a pace. If you, if you actually look at the amount of effort that's gone into supporting Wayland on KDE and GNOME 3, there's been a lot of effort. And they're both very close, and they've both got implementations where you can run uh, both their desktops on top of Wayland. But that's not the issue. And the issue is also not whether games will run better on Wayland or if there's protocol support for in, in, optimising uh, Wayland support for running games. It's the drivers. We've got Intel support, which is fairly decent, but without the proprietary driver support to give that performance that's required for uh, gaming and 3D and what have you, people won't make the switch. Well, here's here I see two things that sort of are hedges in our favor. Uh, the first being, obviously, SteamOS. I mean, Valve has the final say on what ships on SteamOS, and they can continue to use X11 for as long as they want, <clears throat> or they can implement some sort of shim, something like that. But I am, I am encouraged by the news I saw today that the next Serious Sam game is going to ship supporting Vulcan out of the box. And really what the question is, is what we need, the way we need things to line up is we need game developers to support Vulcan, yep. and then we just need the Linux drivers to have good Vulcan support and Wayland support. Not and, and if we can sort of if if everybody's interests and priorities can align this way, we're we're in pretty good shape. And the thing is, a lot of priorities and interests are beginning yeah. to align this way already. The slow pivot. Yeah. So Vulcan could be an answer to that, and I think SteamOS is our short term hedge while this stuff is sort of sorted out because Valve's not gonna ship what Valve doesn't want to ship. Yep. But but the the thing is is that Vulcan has come along while Wayland has been mm -hmm, brewing, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure there's any provision in Wayland for Vulcan at the moment. I could be wrong about that because I haven't looked into it too carefully. And I'm not entirely sure if it matters. Yeah, it doesn't matter. There's no reason why you would want at a display server level to be concerned with something that would be interpreted by the driver and then rendered out that way. Mm. Uh, mm. Hmm. Boy, but you, you know need, what? Surely, surely you need, for example, for for Wayland to. Let's just go back to GL, OpenGL. Surely you need Wayland to understand the OpenGL extensions for it to be able to render those things. And in the same way, surely it needs to be able to do that for for Vulkan as well. That that would be done by the drivers and the stacks on top of them. That's usually done by Mesa. Uh, now, as to what protocol it uses to go into to, to to use this with. I'm, that's that's separate. I'm not so sure. I think Wayland needs to be able to interpret some of those extensions. No, it really doesn't, because all it's going to do, the client of Wayland, is it's going to ask for an OpenGL buffer, and I think you can still speak Vulkan over that. I think you can still upgrade yeah. that to be Vulkan compatible, and it will just render it within that frame that it was dictated by the West End compositor. Yep. Well, uh -huh. one of us is wrong. I would be. I would actually bet. I would actually bet that the answer lies somewhere in the in the middle because it seems it seems too clean one way and it seems too ambiguous the other. But I oh the Talos principles included there. I like that game. <laughs> uh, I, I I will link to the thread that you just put in the uh, chat room, Wes. Uh, there is a Linux gaming thread about how uh, Vulkan will impact open source drivers, and I think they get into Wayland in here. Um, we are about to go through a massive transition, and the closer yep. we get to this, the more and more obvious it is why why Valve was very, very smart and, and thinking ahead when they decided to release SteamOS. Because they're like, this is a great platform for us to target, but and you know they had to know about this stuff coming right. up. I mean, you don't choose Linux as a platform without following what's happening. And maybe that because they now have so much skin in this game, maybe they will be incentivized to work with whoever they need to work with to make this an easier transition for us. Put pressure on game developers to support these newer. We could be so lucky, right? Yep. Isn't that the positive side exactly. of commercial interest using Linux? We could be so lucky. 
Uh, yeah, I wonder. I will find out. I wish we had a crystal ball right now, but uh, I, people in the chat room are saying that you know Fedora twenty four is is uh, with uh, with uh, Wayland is is real and is possible right now. Kitson, I'll give you the last uh, word on uh, performance and reliability, then we'll wrap it up. Go ahead. Yeah, I've actually been using Wayland quite a lot as uh, my oh, cool. daily driver yeah. on uh, the most recent Fedora release. Really, okay. I think Fedora should have just jumped in. Uh, released their current release <laughs> with Wayland and said, "Hey, you know, we we're, we're all about promoting, you know, future technologies. This is what we do. This is what this distro is about." And I think, did you go away, Kitson? Oh, he went away. Come back. When I you... thought he was making a good point. Essentially, I think what his point is is that because Fedora is a cutting edge distro, it's the place to try it. Well, that's probably where we are going to see it first. The outlook is good for the eight ball. Uh, says the uh, Jbot eight ball in the chat room. There you go. There you go. Hey, the outlook that is, is good. the decider. And that's the final word on the. But that's it. Kitson got a good point, and I think when it comes time to do our Fedora review, oh. we're going to have to try it on some yep. Intel hardware. And my XPS has an Intel Iris graphics card on it. Was. Mm-hmm. Chris's new Wayland machine. Hey, yo, tell you what else is new. My friends over at Ting got some new sales I'll tell you about here in just oh. a second. But first, why you should switch to Ting. I love it. I use Ting all the way down to scale and back. And let me tell you, it is nice to know that Ting is mobile that is finally different. No contract, no early termination fee, and you only pay for what you use. $6 for your line, pay for what you use. Oh. So, you go down to a trip to California, maybe use a little more little more data on your way down, on your way up. No bigs, because you know what? Now I'm back here at the JB1 headquarters. I'm, Wi-Fi. On, I'm on the Wi-Fis. Wes, I'm on the Wi-Fi. So, it all is no bigs. So, my bill is cray-cray. With three smartphones, it's cray-cray. Cray cray low. Low. Hey yo. Yeah, like like uh, the the like December was like twenty seven bucks or something. Oh, I couldn't man. believe it. That's and, like one meal out. Yeah, the average ting bill, I guess, uh, per line is like twenty three dollars. So think about a way now. You can go get a smartphone that's completely under your control. You can get the quote unquote Google experience if you likes. Get that real pure experience. Get something that's unlocked, something you own outright, and you're paying like twenty three bucks a month. Whoa. Man, that's great. So Ting also has an ETF relief program. If you're stuck in a duopoly contract, they have super great customer service, a fantastic dashboard to manage your Ting account. I mean, it, it is really the best in the industry. And like I mentioned, they got great sales going right now. So go to linux.ting.com to support the show and get $25 in credit or $25 off a device. If you want an internet phone, they got the iPhone 5S unlocked. You own it outright. 338 bucks right now. Nice. Really nice deal. Uh, the S5 refurbed edition, 298 bucks. That's a great Android phone for 298 bucks. Uh, unlocked yours. Yep. You own that. You own that S. Gal- and with all the money you're going to save on Ting, I mean, that's true. You just buy one of these phones and not worry about it. The Galaxy 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 S6. This is a really nice phone with the octa-core processor, a few gigs of RAM, the PCIe storage, the fantastic camera. You can own it outright, completely unlocked, no contract, 597 bucks. Boom. That's a really good deal. I think I, uh-huh. I think when I got mine, it was like 700 bucks. So. Ooh, don't tell people. That's embarrassing. <sighs> it sucks, dude. But now Rikai's got a great phone. Oh, yeah, so, right. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's a true story. That's, all, that, that, that's, another, uh, that's another Ting success JD story right insider. there. There you go. It, yeah, it pays to be the editor, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, go to Ting. Go get yourself a great phone. Go get yourself a plan. Because really, they've got you know they got stuff as low. You can get a decent phone for as low as a hundred bucks. Um, or actually, if you want to get a feature phone, much lower than that. And if you got a phone, and you probably do, because they got GSM and CDMA networks. So if you got a phone, I encourage you to just go get a SIM card because the SIM cards are really cheap. Nine bucks. You pop a SIM card in. This one SIM card here it fits all your different devices. It like you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's really cool it's the way awesome. they do it, and you just pop it out to the size you need. They they really were pretty clever when they designed this thing. I'm thinking about having Ting be my backup network. You know, when totally. uh, certain other large networks aren't working so yep. well. This is a great way to go. Like if you if you have six dollars a month. We kind of unofficially do it here at the studio already. Ooh. So of course we don't use it as our primary internet here right. at the studio. But when the studio goes out, well the first thing we do is we start tethering from our Ting devices because it's just data. Yep. Like it doesn't affect the contract. I don't have to call up and get a shared program. No, it's just turn it on. And I'll bill it for what you yeah. use. Yeah. Uh, it is really, really nice. Check it out. Linux.ting.com and a big thank you to Ting for sponsoring the unplugged program. Linux.ting.com is where you go to support this show. Okay, let's talk about the Linux Foundation. This happened while I was on the road. I didn't even know this was going down. But apparently, this is 
another disgusting example of what happens in the Linux community. Uh, I'll start you off at the top. So there's been a controversy that's erupted around the Linux Foundation. It's uh, it's it's whether the Linux Foundation essentially is serving open source community or corporate sponsors. That's essentially the takeaway headline. Uh, but uh, the Linux Foundation, the nonprofit organization that supports Linux and increasingly other open source projects, like uh, I'm a big fan of the fact that they have the uh, the core in uh, infrastructure initiative, mm -hmm. which funds a lot of really important open source. Uh, it, they tend to not really have any controversies, but uh, <sighs> I really hate this. Uh, Michael Garrett, uh, a security de developer at uh, CoreOS, former Red Hat employee, et cetera, et cetera, you've probably heard the name before, recently spotted that the Linux Foundation has changed its bylaws to no longer permit individual foundation members to elect members of the group's board of directors. Garrett wrote, the majority of its board is chosen by member companies, 10 by platinum members. Platinum membership costs 500000 a year. Three by gold members. Gold membership costs $100,000 a year. And by one silver member. A silver membership is $5,000 and a $20,000 a year, depending on your company size. Up until recently, individual members, which I am of one, uh, for $99 a year, could also elect two board members, allowing a community uh, perspective to be represented at the board level, which is one of the reasons I became a Linux sure. Foundation member. Get your voice heard. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, this is an article at ZDNet written up by uh, Stephen, and he says, why would the Linux Foundation do this? Garrett speculates. It's because of Karen Sandler, the executive directory, dir director of the Software Freedom Conservancy, um, a woman who we have interviewed many times on our shows. Uh, an organization that does vitally important work of the enforcement of the GPL. I recently shared with you the story about their fight to enforce GPL violations of VMware. VMware, who is a Linux Foundation sure member. Is. So Garrett speculates that the individual membership program was quietly renamed to the individual supporter program, and the promised benefit of being allowed to stand for and participate in board elections was dropped. He compares the old page and gives you a link to the new page. He asked, why would the Linux Foundation do this? Well, he states that historically it's been less than enthusiastic about GPL enforcement, and the Software Freedom Conservancy is funding a lawsuit against one of the Foundation's members for violating the terms of the GPL. He speculates they have made this move to prevent Karen Sandler from joining the board. Um, then, because of this speculation... Karen Sandler has found herself under attack by people who have assumed that her mission is to bring some sort of agenda to the Linux Foundation, a uh, one that uh, they would define as a social justice warrior's right. agenda. And so she has now come under attack because of Garrett's speculation here. Uh, the Linux Foundation uh, didn't help the situation. It's not really their fault, but... Uh, Jim Zimmerman, or Zemmerman, Zemlin, Zemlin. Zemlin, yeah, who I've met and talked to before, he's a nice guy, um, was apparently busy while all this shit was happening, and everybody was declaring that the Linux Foundation had betrayed the community, and that this was an effort to switch to corporate backing, and that this was also an effort to block Karen Sandler. Some even speculated a move by Linus Torvalds himself, orchestrated by Linus himself, some of the crap that's out there is unbelievable. And it turns out, of course, that the guy that runs the Linux Foundation was busy. In China. They couldn't, they couldn't get out because they were in China with limited access to email. As a result, they only became aware of the problem 48 hours after it blew up on social media. And then they tried to make an immediate response on their blog, which completely sucked and was insufficient. Sorry, Jim, but it's true. Uh, the conversations relating to the Linux Foundation governance changes had developed into personal, inappropriate, and offensive remarks, he writes, directed at some members of the community, in particular against Karen Sandler, the executive director of the software Freedom Conservancy. Um, but if you, if you extract yourself from all of that crap, I think the real question behind the debate is who actually is controlling the Linux Foundation? Is it the users? Or is it the companies? Now, the kernel developers themselves are able to direct some member to, to to elect some members of the board, like the technical steering committee. But Michael Garrett, or Matthew Garrett, sorry, sees it as a move as the Linux Foundation is taking one more step away from the community and towards the corporate world. It's not exactly addressed either. That point is not addressed in the Linux Foundation's post. That's why I say it's in, I say it's insufficient. 
But he does tellingly say that the process for a recruiting community director should be changed to be in line with other leading organizations in our community and our industry. In other words, nobody else does it this way. So, In addition, Garrett pointed out individuals are no longer have the ability to run for and vote for the Linux Foundation board seat and influence the direction of the foundation, which I think is a bit of a loss. Mm-hmm. That said, a lot of times what happens is these board positions are clown shows. They're people who are sort of positioned there by a corporate interest. They're people who are want to be pushed, positioned there because it's better for their career to have it on their resume. They are not always, always fully representative of who you actually want. And a lot of times, it's really the companies that have different people in those positions, line them up so that way they can influence things. And even when that's not the case, like in the case of HP, It's often accused to be the case. It's claimed to be the case. So it often looks bad anyways. It is, to me, uh, coming back from my trip, I look at this and I go, this looks like a hot mess. And uh, I I find myself to be sort of like taken aback by all of it. Wimpy, I'm I'm curious what your reaction is. I see you had some thoughts. Wow, Wimpy. Mm -hmm. What? Are we in the wrong? Oh, sorry, Wimpy. Go ahead. Sorry, we're in the wrong room. Wimpy, are you there? Did we lose you? I think he's so upset he left, Wes. Well, we should take a moment and have a beer. We should take a moment and have a beer. I do think he makes a good point, though, that, uh, you know, we have to consider the nature of Linux. You know, it's an open source thing. It exists on its own. The Linux Foundation has always been, you know, like he says, a trade association. It's kind of a a nice mechanism to extract Mm -hmm. money from people who use Linux for their profits and then gear that, you know, they use it for open, you know, the infrastructure. But it has not, it is not. And as, as Greg K.H., talks in the our, our Linux link. Yeah. You know, it the community members haven't necessarily besides B Dale been good representations of the community. Yes. They haven't really functioned this way, so right. maybe in name only. I really like so Greg KH took to sub, to to Linux subreddit and responded to some comments and I really we're going to link to that in the show notes because I really liked his his take on it. Uh, I don't know, can we not hear anybody in the uh mumber room? Somebody say North Ranger say something for me. Can you? Do you say it? Yeah. yeah, do you see him lighting up? Yep. Well, I don't know what's going on. Computers are hard, Wes. I don't know what's yep. going on. We're not experts here. No, no. I, I don't I don't understand how computers work. And as far as I'm concerned, uh, we should all go back to uh, calculators. I don't know. Maybe close that thing and reopen it for me, Wes. I have no idea. I have no idea. I, I look at this, and I, I, I'm, trying, I'm trying to suss out if there is bad blood between the Linux Foundation and the Software Freedom Conservancy. That's really my question. Right. Is there something going on there? Is the Linux Foundation affected by its members. Um, I, would, might, oh. I, I would tell you, I would like to sit here and tell you, because I have a lot of respect for the Linux Foundation. I've worked with them on some projects in the past, several projects They do in a the lot past. of good things for the ecosystem. Yeah, yeah. Like they pay Greg and Linus. Mm-hmm. That's a great, con- yeah, right? and the core infrastructure, all kinds of stuff. Um, they, I also, I also have seen sort of a side of the Linux Foundation that gives me pause because it doesn't seem genuine. It doesn't seem honest. And that is there are news outlets online that purport to be just straight news outlets that are actually PR fronts just press releases, kind for of. the members of the Linux Foundation, primarily SUSE and Red Hat, but others as well, that hire people that are their PR people to write articles for them, and then they publish them on these quote-unquote news sites as like as, a, as an article that essentially implies this is why you should use distro, you know, insert Red Hat or SUSE or whatever, right. instead of something else. And it's, they are essentially native advertising pieces that the Linux Foundation is allowing their members, their contributing members, to publish through their publishing platforms. And I find that to be disingenuous, and I also over the years have found it to actually be shaping the tone of the conversation in the community, and I find that to also be disgusting and disingenuous. So I would like to say that I have absolute respect for the Linux Foundation, but if I'm being completely honest with you, I have seen some practices that seem disingenuous to me. I, I, it, basically, it seems that if you write a big enough check to Linux Foundation, you get access to their publishing platform. Kind of do what they want, you and, want. And that bothers me, because as somebody who publishes... Like that, that really bothers me. Now, maybe I have it wrong. Maybe I don't. But I do wonder if this is a shift more towards corporate funding, corporate sponsoring, corporate interest, which is honestly where Linux makes its bones right now. And maybe this is a moment for us as community members to consider, you know, just 
how we think of the Linux Foundation in terms of the larger ecosystem and other organizations that maybe can do similar roles. The other thing, the other thing I question, and I wish I knew more about it, and I absolutely welcome Matthew Garrett to come on the show if he wants to tell us about it himself. The Mumble Room is open when it's working. What I don't understand exactly is why Matthew made these speculations about the GNOME found the Linux Foundation making these changes specifically to uh, to try to screw Karen. Um, I know that there was some timing of some talks canceled and all that kind of stuff, but when you talk to Karen, there doesn't seem to be any malice on her part. And I'm just wondering where that speculation came from because it right. led to some weird stuff that happened. And I'm kind of curious why he did that and maybe if he knows something that we don't know. But it seems like he went to his blog and made some speculations that ended up causing a shit ton of issues for the Linux Foundation who are honestly doing something that any foundation would normally do. I don't necessarily agree with it, but – And there is merit to him bringing test. up that they did away with the seeds. It's yes. just kind of the other stuff that got glommed yes. on there that maybe took away from that. Exactly. Exactly. Like, I think it's a good thing to mention. As a contributing member, right. I, I You wouldn't have known this otherwise, exactly. probably. Exactly. That part, totally valid. We should have a conversation about that. The speculation where why they did it, it feels off base because it's nothing unusual for a foundation to do like this. It, by their own bylaws, they're allowed to make right. these changes it's like this. It's all internal. Yeah. So, I... I I don't know exactly. It, it leaves me. It leaves me a, a taking a bit of a pause. Uh, but the 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 full write up. Uh, Stephen J. Uh, Von Hoff Nicholas did a great. Uh, I just added the Hoff. Who wasn't? He wasn't at scale. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah, he's like pretty much one of the only Linux quote unquote celebrities that wasn't at scale. I don't know. I mean, that's all right. Noah was there showing him up, so it doesn't matter. Yeah, he, yeah. He would have JB to, Zone. He would have had to compete with Noah. I can understand why. How many want. people can do that? How can you? Right. He doesn't bring the Google Glass though. Really? You know That's why? That's disappointing. You know why? No. Here's something you'd never know unless you're a glass hole. If you change radical climates, Google Glass gets destroyed. Only because, so the way that it works is the projector mm-hmm. that projects the thing in your eyeball, it projects against a foil uh, reflection, reflection, reflective material okay. uh, that's on the end of the prism that then bounces it back into your eyeball. Oh. When you travel and see where Noah's at, it's like below, it's like yep. negative 16 Fahrenheit right now. So it's like crazy cold. It's inhuman cold. Yep. It literally is not No one survival. should live there. No. He should move and he should come, come to see Come join us in the PN tub. But he's, you know, like the boiling frog, he doesn't know life any other way. But what he has learned is when he travels to places that have human climates, like the West Coast, yep. uh, I, I'm not, boy, people are snowed in right now. I'm... We don't get any snow, so I, I don't mean to make fun of you. But anyways, he travels. If he makes large climate changes, the foil that, it, that the prism uses for projection reflection bubbles up, and it destroys the ability to project anything in Google Glass. Permanently? Yeah. And so wow. as he has to get it replaced every time he does this. And Google's been pretty good about it, but now they don't make glass anymore. He feels like this might be his last glass. Yeah. So now, he can, now he's afraid to travel with it in the winter. So it's a home glass. It's home glass because yep. it's too cold where he lives. <laughs> Yeah, he needs like uh, a humidor for it. Yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe. Now, now, hold on. Now, see, a Gates uh, earthquakes ain't got nothing to do with climate. That's the two separate issues. Yeah. yeah, we're gonna have an earthquake. That's why I drove Highway 101 so I could see the coast before it falls off into the ocean. I thought it'd be beautiful. Uh, I, I don't know what to do about a mumble room. Yeah, I don't know what to do about that. Freak high. What's going on? What's I'm, going? What's, I'm not sure. What's going on with that? You closed and opened it, right? I sure did. Yeah, I don't know. We're in the on-air channel. Yeah, we are. That's we are. You know what I'm going to do? I'll reset the channel over on the mixer. Here we go. You ready for that? Let's see here. What's you? I think that we should all make those businesses yeah, okay. fail. Yeah, I just got to purge this buffer over here. Get it out of here. Okay. Here we go. Okay, Wimpy, uh, can you can you say something now? Are you there? Hello. Yeah, we can. Yay! Yay! Hey, back. hey, it worked. Look Our at that. dearest friends, the mumble room. <laughs> That's all you got to do. You, guys, you just got to reset the channel and flesh a little bit. So was, if there's anything you want to con- uh, mention on the foundation thing, go ahead. Uh, no, I think Wes covered it. My point was very brief, and that's that the Linux Foundation is a trade as- a trade association. You pay to be a member of that trade association, and the Linux Foundation represent the interests of its members. And for the most part, the interests of its members are going to be conflicted with grassroots community stuff. Mm. There's going to be some overlap. You know, you've right. mentioned core infrastructure projects and all the rest of it. That's terrific. But be in no doubt that we're a we benefit as a byproduct of them serving. Look, the we made you a members. nice platform that works. Oh, you guys can have it yeah. for free. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. I mean, you know, it, it, but you know, they're yeah. 
<laughs> that's it. It's a uh, trade association. Yeah. Yeah. There are lots of them in different industries, and that's how they work. I would understand that they wanted to remove, you know, instead of having two seats, they wanted to limit it so they could have, they could open another seat to another, you know, another corporate interest or something like that. I would, that makes sense. But to completely remove the community from the situation is just really weird. It feels like it made them special to me. It feels like what made them special is gone. Right. I don't think we'd question it if they'd never had one, if that had nothing grown up. But the fact that they have yeah. had it and then yeah. just remove it, even yeah. if it wasn't necessarily doing its job, it, yeah, it's hard to ignore. To see the internet go batshit crazy, though, and say that Linus is orchestrating some sort of campaign against social justice <laughs> warriors is sort of like... I can't imagine he would care for more than his colonel to even worry about that. Yeah, it's a total yeah, misread of what Linus' kind of priorities are. Yeah. Uh, it 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 shows what total lack of understanding people have of how they have the how the community actually works. Mm-hmm. It's sort of ridiculous. Um, no, yeah, we've got a community calling for our our destruction here, Chris. You see Why is that? that? No, what happened in this earthquake? Oh, I know, dude, dude. They're gonna they're gonna totally they're gonna totally call call it to ha- cause it to happen. Thanks, guys. <sighs> Thanks, guys. That's all right. And then I'll just have to move over to uh, to. Uh, yeah, you got a mobile home now. Yeah, man. My my. I got. I got. I'm. I, I live on springs and shocks. I. I won't even notice. But uh, no, actually, that's not true. Uh, you know what I do notice? Linux Academy, because I notice that they have made some major improvements over at Linux Academy. I'd like you to go there. It's a learning platform for Linux and all the technologies around it. Everything that really kicks ass in the Linux ecosystem, they've got stuff to help you learn and manage it, uh, including like AWS platforms, uh, of course, the Red Hat certified courses, step by step video courses. Is so many of them. Downloadable comprehensive study guides. Instructor help is available. Seven plus distros for you to choose from. That's the highlights. Well, Linux Academy has really been rocking. They just had a big announcement recently. They've rolled out a ton of new features, but one I want to talk about today, which I think is super cool, is the new Linux Academy mobile app for iOS and Android. This is a really, really great idea. If you get a couple of minutes on your device, I think this is going to be the way to go. You're going to see the Android version coming at the end of Q1 2016. It's going to be free for all the users. Of course, you're going to need to be a member to take advantage of it. But look at that. Right there, it gives you an idea of what it's like to become a Linux Academy member. You go in there, you can create, you can choose a topic. They go, you go into Linux certification training. You can go into OpenStack, AWS, DevOps. Then once you go into those realms, there is so much content to learn. There is scenario-based labs. There are great, great exercises for you to take. There are nuggets to go deep dive into a single topic when you're ready, in-depth resources, virtual machines that spin up with the courseware on demand that you can SSH into, brand new CDN to distribute all of that content, and live streams of a bunch of really, really great sessions where you can ask the educators questions directly. It's amazing how helpful this is, just if you want to be a Linux professional in any way, right? Like, maybe you've been doing it forever and you want to catch up with what's this DevOps jazz you keep hearing about. One of the things, there's two things at Linux Academy were were really kind of like game changers for me personally. The first one was taking courseware and breaking it down into hours. Mm -hmm. You know, learn Python in six hours. No longer this nebulous thing, oh, I need to spend six hours that I can actually understand Python. But the other thing is, is I suck at taking tests. Like, not my thing. I hate it. Like, because I always feel like tests are like of these scenarios that never actually happen in the real world. And so then I In the real world, you just Google for the answer. (laughs) Right. So now, one of the things they have to help with test anxiety that I have is practice exams. Nice. Yeah, you can use Linux Academy practice exams to help prepare your way through the, like like maybe AWS Mm -hmm. or one of the Red Hat courses or anything like that. Uh, You can also take Linux Academy quizzes to help ensure you're learning the core concepts required to be successful. So not just pass the test, not just passing the test. Really understanding it. Yeah, that's you don't really use nice. it. You know, you've already deployed it once you've finished with Linux Academy. And as a listener of our program, you go to Linux Academy, uh, uh, LinuxAcademy.com/unplugged. You get a great discount. That's cool thing number one. LinuxAcademy.com/unplugged. But because we've been talking about Linux Academy for a while now. Lots of JB members in their community. Lots of Jupiter Colony members up in that community. So you're hanging out with a great group of friends that help give you that sort of confidence boost when you need it or celebrate when you've got some breakthrough. It's really cool. LinuxAcademy.com slash Unplugged. And a big thank you to Linux Academy for sponsoring the Unplugged program. And congrats on the new app and all of the new updates. You guys are kicking. And Anthony was down at uh, scale. I didn't get a chance to say hi to him. But he was down at scale, so you might have got a chance to say They really are community members. I loves it. Yeah, they're huge enthusiasts. It's really cool. So AMD has got something hot for us. 
GPU Open. GPU Open is composed of two areas, games and CGI for games, graphics, and content creation. Holy moly, Whoa. you guys. Yeah, they're the first to provide code, they say, and documentation allowing PC developers to uh, exert more control over the GPU. But that's the first part of it. The second part of it is a commitment to open source software. The game and graphics development community is an active hub of enthusiasts and individuals who believe in the value of sharing knowledge. Full and flexible access to the source of tools, libraries, and effects is a key pillar of the GPU open philosophy. So it's not just talking to the driver. It's art assets. It's all kinds of stuff. Documentation. The fancy libraries. You need to take advantage of their sweet, sweet hardware. So this is being put on by AMD. I understand. Is Mm -hmm. that your understanding as well? Uh, Every single year. Here's where I'm at with this. I'm getting real sick and tired of this crap. I'm getting real bitter. And I'm, I'm becoming a little skeptical. Every year I sit here and I'm reading you stories about how AMD is going to revolutionize their open source graphics driver, how they're going to decouple this, how they're going to have user space that, kernel space that, how they're going to have initiative this, protocol that. And every single year I feel like I'm just reading a different version of this story. And this is the coolest version yet that gets me just as excited as ever. And by the end of the day, what the hell's actually going on, Wes? What's going on here? Unfortunately, I think we're still in the wait and see. You know, I'm glad they've launched this website. They've had code up on GitHub for a little while. Um, but until, you know, we're still waiting for Vulkan. We're st- still I, waiting for I the am, I am just, all of the AMD GPU stuff uh, to land I am in the kernel getting, and be deployed by distributions. I know I piss off all of the AMD fans when I say this, but I'm just not impressed. I, I, I love all of the things they're saying. And every time they say them, I love them every single time. And then I just, I don't under, it, it, I guess what it feels like to me right now is before the last idea ever even sees code, they got a whole new idea that's even better than the last idea. That, that's, right, we had Mantle and now, well, now it's, they're supporting Vulkan, which is good, but it's yeah. still like. And I feel like for three years I've been hearing about how they're going to split the graphics drivers up and it's going to be super awesome and you can just use the open source driver and if you want a few more features, you go get this binary blob in user space and you're good to go. To be fair, they never actually claimed that Mantle is coming to Linux. They even were True. asked specifically, and they just basically dismissed it, saying that if people wanted it, then maybe they'd consider it. But now they're actually saying that the, since they're doing open source, it's actually going to be coming. And I think it's great. You know, the, like what they're saying is great, and uh, I'm I'm optimistic. But you know, it's been ten years since they were reasonably usable in Linux, so at this point, I'm still not going to buy their stuff. Yeah, it's hard to come back from underperforming to such a level. Here's why it's a double burn for me, and this really upsets me. So not only are they saying crap that I like and want, and then not delivering as far as I can estimate, at least in any material way that actually matters at all, but at the same time, it's like, hey, everybody, and this is something the Windows users, like the savvy ones are starting to give Linux users a hard time about. Hey, come to the Linux desktop, the land of free and open source choice, where you have all the great choices in the world. Oh, except for your graphics card, if you want any performance at all, use NVIDIA. Replace most of your weird X stack with this. So, like, we have one video card manufacturer that makes, I mean, like, really, where, where's the choice? You can use Intel and have a subpar experience. You can use NVIDIA or you can use AMD. And in, in, in my testing, the NVIDIA is by far and, 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 and really the only easy one-click solution by most distros for end users to implement and get great graphics performance. Yeah. We have one choice if you're a regular end user in Linux land, and it's NVIDIA. There's, there's no, come to the land of multiple choice except for why here you only have one choice. And, and, and AMD has done nothing in all this time, nothing to change the situation. A lot of good talk. I get all hot and bothered. They kind of just have followed NVIDIA's track but not done it as well. Wimpy, what do you think? Mm. You think the Iris graphics is, uh, is finally there? You think we're finally, finally there with the 6100? I'm not the biggest gamer, but I have embraced Steam in the last few months, and my NUC with Iris 6100 plays all the games hmm. I have, and I've got I, most I think, of the... I don't know if I have a 6100 machine. I don't know if I have one. I haven't tried that one. But and, the, I'm, and I'm and not just running the games, but running the games at um, Quad HD. So just to be clear, this is not 4K. Quad HD is... Uh, uh, 1440p. That's nice. What? That's not. What? William, I'm curious to see what you think about this. 
So I think AMD has been in the state where they just have to announce paper launches for things. <laughs> yeah. And so they're like, we have this great idea. Here it is. But they're not going to have that thing materialized for years. Like, oh, we've made an initial commit and we have a plan. Here's this thing we're launching. But it's not going to launch for a couple of years until, until we get down the road, until we have hardware support, until we have all these things, until we've actually written the software. So like, don't, don't abandon us. Don't abandon us. Right. They don't want you to abandon them because they're kind of falling behind and they're trying to show all these paper releases that just aren't there yet. And so I think that's is, the state we're in. I hope we get there and I think we will get there eventually. Okay. So is the it's way, just going to take time. So do you think the way to look at GPU open is more about – it's a piece to the overall strategy. So uh, yes. an open source driver is a piece to that, um, but also a piece to that is giving developers open u- resources – to take advantage of to make great games like it's it's part of the overall strategy but it's just part of it and we're just waiting around that re- that's really what's going on here isn't it i mean it's even like the splitting of the gpu driver it's part of the strategy they're going to try and make all the kernel space stuff open and integrated into the mainline kernel and then have a bunch of user space components that they can change out right. depending on whether you want proprietary features or not right Sounds so nice and they're just we're slowly getting there like they just started committing this i want to say like five kernel versions back and we're finally getting to somewhere where it's usable. Yeah, they have at least dumped some code into the kernel, which is... But they announced good. it way back when. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's where it's the I, same old. That's where I'm kind of like, oh, come on already. But I like the idea of open source resources, graphic assets, all that kind of stuff for developers. That's really cool. We'll see if they can get their foot in the door with like scientific stuff, if OpenCL can really yeah. compete with... Yeah. Close, you know, yeah. The Nvidia Google. stuff there. Yeah. yeah. And they're also distracted with all their side projects. Like they're building the A1100 ARM chips and they got to get right. Zen out the door and they got to get the new <laughs> GPU architecture done. Like they've got all these things that yeah. they're kind of. <laughs> even the A1100, that was a huge paper release. Like they talked about this three years ago as being ready in a year and it still isn't even shipping. Like we're just getting there now, hopefully. So we'll see. You know, I've talked about this before, but you look at the next three years for Linux. Mm hmm. We have never had more change coming, ever. So you have, you have uh, obviously, we've talked about today, Wayland coming. You have Vulkan coming, right? You have the continuation of evolution of System D and Bus 1 or KD Bus, whatever it's going to be. That's coming. And all of these transitions are going to be some of the biggest transitions we have ever seen in the desktop, ever. Like, a lot of times we see things that are really huge on the cloud and the server, but this... This is going to be huge. And Wimpy, there's another big one that I didn't even mention coming, isn't there? Yeah, well, ZFS is, I think, it's going to really gain traction in uh, in the Linux world mm-hmm. over the next yeah. 12 months, yeah. 18 months. Well, I'll be running ZFS on root machines with Wayland in like three <laughs> years on a- open source AMD graphics. It'll be a glorious future. In system D containers. Yeah, yeah. right, exactly. And Spawn, man. <laughs> oh, whatever you're drinking, Wes, I want a pint. <laughs> you know what? I'm gonna, we'll, just, we'll just end it right there. That's a good way to wrap it up on the Unplugged show. It is going to be a couple yeah. of crazy years, and guess what? We're going to be talking about it. Stay Every tuned. Every single annoying minutia along the way. We'll be discussing right here on your talk show, Linux Unplugged. We'd love to have you join us. Don't forget, we do this show on Tuesdays. Go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar to get the live time. JBLive.tv is where you watch it. LinuxActionShow.reddit.com is where you go to submit content and stories. And you heard our virtual log. You can participate in that. You just need the Mumble software, open source software. Go to our IRC room. You can get the info on how to join us. We'd love to have you here on the Unplugged program. But if you can't make it, the subreddit is just great. All right, thanks for being here. See you right back here next Tuesday. I kind of feel like I'm going to get some crap for calling out the Linux Foundation on that on that news outlet thing, but that is something that they do that really bothers me. Yeah, is it feels really dishonest, uh, and it, it's basically you know you got to be of a certain you got to be of a certain con- contribution level. It seems I can't I can't exactly tell what it is, and you have to have writing staff, and if you meet those qualifications, you get to publish through some fairly well 
well-established news outlets, and then on top of that, because they're uh, because they're established enough, all of this all of the news syndication sites pick up those yep. stories, and then it just becomes part of the discussion. And it feels like they get background cred in the community because of the Linux Foundation name on the front, right? Even if the company at play maybe uses it for their yeah. end, but doesn't isn't a good community player. It's not something I've brought up before a lot because I feel like I'm going. There's going to be a certain amount of backlash because I value my relationship with the Linux Foundation because I think, in other words, they in other in other realms they do a lot of good, and I've worked with them in several projects before, and they've been fruitful, and I enjoyed that, and and also uh, you know I like to be able to speak to the people that they pay they write the paychecks to. Uh, but at the end of the day, like that is a concern of mine that I have. So it's a real tight line for me to walk there. But I kind of feel like I have to say it's something that bothers me. And it doesn't mean that they're bad as a whole. It just means this is an aspect that happens that I don't quite understand. Maybe I'm wrong about. But to me, I would like to know more information about it. And it doesn't. It doesn't preclude the fact that they also contribute to open source projects when right. they can. That they contribute to people that are making incredible changes in the Linux kernel. It doesn't doesn't it doesn't take away from any of that. So. I hope I don't get too much crap for it, but I'm probably going to get some crap. Well, you always get crap. That's just... <laughs> have you been to the internet before? I don't know, but yeah, yeah, that's yeah, all that's it's true. Made. That's true. I do that. That's a good point. I keep but, trying to think of like what's the worst case Slack scenario because it, because I'm starting to slide, Wes. I'm sliding into Slack, and, and it's like, very, I mean I've had a great. I love that they have. I mean even if it's just Chromium, they have the Linux dev files. So that, yeah, I've enjoyed that. Yeah, right? I, I on I've, I, I think it's Sudclutter. I can't remember what the name of it is that I'm using on the Linux desktop for a dedicated Slack oh, client. Nice. Okay, and uh, you know their iOS client is great. Android, no complaints yep, there really yep. either. But I mean even we have a couple channels just for like individual projects, and on some of them we've gone past ten thousand messages. Yeah. And then the archive starts to go away. And it's like, you start depending, especially on things like where you're sharing information, you're like, oh, well, just just pass there. I know there was some information I wanted, and I put it in this channel wow. for use. And, and that's so we are, you pay? we've asked if, like, you know, we're trying to see if, not yet. So we haven't been uh-huh. paying. Yeah, we're seeing about thing. paying. And the so if we can. Is serious. Right. So that, I saw, like, there was a recent thread Did you, uh, on Reddit you, about Mattermost. Yeah, yeah. I, I have know. not actually tried it. I know, I should, huh? The thing and is. And then Rocket Chat, I guess. The thing that matter most isn't going to deliver for me right now, at least, is it takes 30 seconds almost to set up a new Slack. Like, yep, it's, it's super easy. Great. And if I'm hosting it myself, I just I don't really have time for this right now. I just need problems solved. Yeah. I don't want to create more problems down the road. But here's what I'm truly, truly worried about. And I don't know exactly where you go to find it. I'm, I'm trying to figure out. Yeah, like if you, so here's an example like if I want to upgrade to standard edition $880 per year is what it would cost Ooh. Jupiter Broadcasting right now. And that's just cuz we only we only have 11 users in our yep. Slack. I think for us it was somewhere in the couple grand range. Yeah, or 8 per user per month. That's a little more swallowable for me. sending but... invoices out to uh, crew members. So then it goes back to, well, okay, it's kind of worth looking at Mattermost. But it is it has become a critical tool. And the thing, the other... The and other Slack does it well. And the other problem is a lot of people now have Slack accounts. Yep. So you can, it's sort they of like... They already have the client on their phone. Yeah. 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 They already know how to use it, too. Right. And some people are already kind of like Slack clever. And they like, yeah. So, ah. Uh, I like that one of them. I don't remember who was Mattermost or Rocket Chat. I think had better markdown support. Slack has like partial, but yeah. it's not. Markdown support would be killer because then we could actually cut and paste stuff right into show notes. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody should set up a Mattermost for us and let us try it out. Maybe we need like a Mattermost Slack bridge. Well, I would I would be, I would also like to know if people know of a hosted Mattermost solution. Yeah, that you can just pay some yeah. reasonable amount for Yeah, it. because I just don't, I, I just am not in a position to manage more stuff. I, like if I have free time right now, I want to spend it on other projects right now. Yeah. I don't really want to spend my time on that. So. I would really like to get a, a recommendation. I wonder if there's also just for for me, like maybe I can just set up the IRC bridge and then have a IRC program that saves all my history, archives it that way, keep both the, keep the free model. Hmm. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, well, I assume that. I, so when when I think of hosting Mattermost, right, my my mind immediately goes to uh, well, I'm going to spin up a DigitalOcean droplet, right, and I'm going to register a domain, and I'm going to create user accounts, and then I'm going to convince all of the JB people to switch over from Slack to this new system, and we're going to have to do a clean a clean break of our history, uh, and then when we fill up space or we want more users or whatever, it's always going to be on me to do it, and just right. I'm not digging that idea. That's a big workload. But and again, you're not going to want to troubleshoot it when you, right before the show. Then again, I don't feel like spending a grand a year for essentially fancy IRC. Right. When you 
have the technical capability, it's yeah. just not maybe the time or It's a will. real son of a bitch problem. <laughs> yeah. I almost wish I was ignorant and just had to pay. Because then <laughs> right. I, my, my decision is made. Fine, yeah, yeah. bottom line. <laughs> and it's like, Too smart for your own good, Chris. Yeah, you know, I guess that is kind of a thing. I don't know. 